Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for our very first Shopify virtual meetup of 2022. Um, I know that we are still waiting for quite a few people to filter in, um, but I just thought I'd quickly jump on here um, to fill the white noise. Um, I was going to get some background music happening, but I'm not that organised this morning, so um, you get to just listen to me. Um, I would love to hear from everyone. Um, this is a really interactive meetup as with all of our virtual meetups. So um, please feel free to jump in the chat. Would love to hear who's joining us today. If we've got some familiar faces or any new faces. Um, and yeah, would love to um, see who is in the call today and where you're joining us from. So feel free to use the chat. Hey Susie from Avoca Beach. Where is that? Is that in Western Australia? I want to say Western Australia, but I could be completely wrong. So apologies if it's totally wrong. Oh, North of Sydney. Oh, hope you haven't been too affected by the flood. Sorry if we sent down all of the rain from Queensland. Hey, Emma, nice to have you. Oh, there's <laughs> cool. There's also a lot of people from Reload in here too. And is this everyone's first meetup or do we have some, um, some returning people in here as well? Oh, there's a few people from the beaches. First time for Scott. So great to have you here, Scott. Hope you enjoy the, the webinar today. Oh, Fred's, <laughs> Fred's dialing in from wet Sydney. Awesome, sounds like we've got a few first timers here. So yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, really excited to have you part of, I guess, the whole Shopify meetup um, community. Um, Reload have been running these for, I think probably like five years now. Um, so yeah, obviously when COVID happened, we started to turn those virtual. Um, so yeah, really excited we get to kind of welcome all these people from Melbourne and Sydney and the Sunshine Coast who wouldn't have been able to get to our in-person meetups. Um, and even some people from New Zealand, that's really nice to see. Um, so yeah, I guess what we might do is we're a few minutes in now, so we might just get started and then everyone else who um, is running a little bit behind can kind of jump in um, as and when we need to. So um, as you would know, um, for anyone that has been to one of our meetups before, this is not like an in-person meetup. Um, as you can see, like I'm really encouraging people to jump on the chat. Um, it's a really good community here as part of like Shopify. So please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, you're not going to interrupt the speakers um, as if you were if you were sitting in a crowd and whispering to your neighbor. So please feel free to use the chat. Ask as many questions as you want to while the people while our presenters are talking. Um, what we'll be doing is consolidating all of those questions at the end um, and then having the Q&A panel as well. Um, also, just so you know, this meetup is being recorded, so we will share that um, along with the resources that we have from our speakers um, at the end of the session today as well. So um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Emily and I'm the head of growth here at Reload. So I've worked in the digital space now for I think 13 plus years um, and I've been at Reload now for about five and a half of those and I can honestly say I'm still loving every single minute of it. Um, Reload is an independent digital marketing agency who focus on developing really customised solutions that help businesses grow and always be at the forefront of digital. So for us, it's about building a really long lasting relationship that sees us kind of become extensions of our clients' teams, which is why we've been fortunate enough to work on some of the leading brands um, within Australia and internationally that you see up on the screen there. So no matter what the industry, every e-commerce we think is unique um, and deserves a tailored approach. So our kind of team work on developing multi-channel digital strategies around each business objectives um, for both the short and the long term. We have a team of innovative leaders and specialists who are constantly pushing the boundaries and finding new creative ways to do that given the ever-changing market. Um, our multi-channel solutions consider everything from the overarching strategy development all the way through to execution across paid, brand, advertising, SEO, content, email, and everything that you can think of in between. So if you are looking for any kind of support for digital marketing for your business, please feel free to get in touch either by phone or email. And again, all of the details will be shared in the follow-up email um, at the end of the session as well. But enough about Reload. Let's kind of dive into why we're here today, which is about diversifying the marketing mix. So every three, every three years we see 
a shift in the industry, whether it's like big SEO updates like Panda and Penguin that saw some businesses get really hard. And the shift that we're now seeing is in particular relation to privacy and, and those impacts that it has on marketing and targeting and tracking, I guess, the overall visibility um, of how previously valuable channels are now performing. And it's not an easy thing to figure out how to actually navigate this, which is why I'm super excited to handle this whole conversation and topic over to our amazing list of panelists who will be bringing their own take um, on how you can basically diversify for 2022 and beyond. So today we are joined by four amazing specialists who are all kind of experts in their field. Um, so we have Josh Potosi, who's joining us from Shopify, um, Alex McCann, who's joining us from Reload, Kate Cook uh, from The Lumery, um, and Andy Douglas, who's from Steady Rack. Um, each of these speakers are going to take you through what they found and seen and things that you can basically take away. And we'll also be welcoming them back at the end, as I said, for that Q&A. So again, just another reminder, please feel free to pop in any questions that you have into the chat feature. Um, and we will consolidate them and get through as many as we possibly can. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Josh. So Josh is one of our seasoned pros at these types of events. He's spoken at quite a few of ours already um, and is a popular face, I would say, on the circuit. Um, in Josh's role, he's helped launch hundreds of merchants on Shopify Plus, but today he works in the Merchant Solutions Engineer um, at Shopify, where he helps stores solve complex problems and get the most out of the platform for their business. Um, so with those recent updates that happened to Shopify markets, Josh is going to take us through um, expanding your channels and how markets are making that easier than ever to go international. So Josh, I will hand the reins over to you. Thank you. G'day. Um, yeah, so as Emily said, I'm a, uh, a merchant solutions engineer with Shopify. Um, Make sure that's all good. Yeah, so I, I work with um, basically our, our largest, but also like most technically complex merchants and help them find new ways to, to unlock um, you know, new revenue using Shopify. Um, one of the most complex uh, problems that we get asked is, um, is around markets and particularly lately with um, you know, all the changes around you know, the um, iOS and privacy, um, people are looking at how they can expand um, into different markets and basically unlock new areas of revenue. Um, so when we announced this a new kind of product called Markets, which you might have seen in the admin, um, every single call that I had, uh, it was the first question that came up. So just to give you a sense of, you know, what even some of the bigger players are looking at, um, international and how to expand your business into different regions is uh, top of mind, um, and it's a huge opportunity. Um, so today I want to basically walk you through what Markets means um, and how you can kind of use it to, to grow your business into different regions. To give you a sense of the opportunity here, um, these are obviously quite macro, but this is some of the growth that we've seen as a platform um, into different regions. So 25% of global um, e-commerce growth in 2020. Um, during our 2021 BFCM period, we saw that 15% of orders were actually cross-border, so selling from your uh, main country into a different country. Uh, traffic from international visitors is growing. Um, and I think these last two numbers are, are really important. Um, what we're seeing is there is an increasing trend for buyers shopping internationally. And I think we actually see this even more in Australia. Um, we're quite a, a small market. So we see that a lot of merchants get to a point in their growth quite quickly that they need to start expanding into, you know, at least New Zealand, um, but, you know, the US and the EU and big markets. So we're seeing a trend of merchants needing to go international quite quickly in Australia. Um, and as this becomes more expected from customers, um, you need to make sure that you're offering the type of features that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the, uh, you know, the challenges of actually going international? Um, we hear this a lot. So there's, there's a few big ones. So understanding when is the right time to actually go into a different market. It requires a lot of resourcing. Um, it requires a lot of, you know, data and, and insight. There can be a big investment to set up in a different country. So you need to know when is the right time. Um, you know a lot about your particular customers, but it's really Shopify's job to understand the customers of, you know, um, people in different countries. So you're not going to know what customers in the Netherlands expect when it comes to payments and, you know, all those type of things. Um, so we hope that we can kind of solve some of those um, or answer some of those questions for you. Um, and then just investing the time and money into maintaining different market solutions. So if you want to have a US and an AU store and manage those, um, that's a, you know, a whole resourcing question that you need to be able to answer as well. So we want to make it really easy to manage all these different markets as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
So the way that we've done this um, traditionally, and um, some of you might be doing this today, is basically having multiple different sites. Excuse me, um, multiple different sites for each of your regions, basically. So you might have an AU store, you might have a US store, and you manage those separately. Um, some of you might even just be thinking about this right now. So you're starting to think about, okay, I want to go into the US. How should I do that on Shopify? And you might be thinking about doing a multi-store approach. There's a few challenges with that um, today. So for one, you might have um, separate tools like um, you know Zero or an inventory system or warehouse system. And once you set up different stores, you then need to be able to connect all those and maintain those connections. Um, you need to do you know plenty of different content, different pricing languages, all of those type of things. Um, so we don't want to say that going multi-store is necessarily going to be the wrong option in the future, um, but it's going to be for stores that maybe have different teams in different countries or different legal entities or um, have completely different brands or content um, depending on the country. Um, but we want to have a better solution that's more consolidated into a single store. And so that's what we're building towards now. Um, so today we have some cross-border selling tools that you've probably seen. So if you're using Shopify payments, um, you can sell in multiple currencies so that people can check out in their own currency. Um, there is some support for multiple languages and we've built some first-party apps like um, the geolocation app that makes you know, switching between sites depending on where you are in the world really easy. Um, but there's still some limitations and, and some downsides here. So it's hard to really see what a storefront will actually look like to someone you know, shopping from the US. Um, a lot of these features like multi-currency and multi-language aren't necessarily intuitive to find um, within your Shopify store. Um, and if you're setting up a new store, you then have to go in and, and set all this up again multiple different times. There's a lot of redundant work that's required um, and it's not particularly easy. So that's what we're trying to solve with Shopify markets. Um, and I'll just run through some of the features and, and how you can use them today. So the idea is basically, um, regardless of where you want to sell, um, as soon as you uh, start a Shopify store, um, you know, day one, you have the potential to expand anywhere in the world. Um, so, you know, if you're selling today, fantastic. A lot of these features will, will be applicable, but also if you're just starting out, um, the idea is that we shouldn't be the inhibitor to you going and selling into any particular country. And there's two different kind of buckets that are going to let you do this. Um, on the left is the customer facing side of things. Um, so these are things that your customers will see that make it easier for them to shop regardless of where they are in the world. So things like using the right domain. So if you're coming from the US, you might go to .com and australia.com.au. Um, things like languages. So being able to actually show the right language depending on where you are automatically. Um, and then things like payment methods and duties that I'll touch on in a second. And then the second bucket of things are things that make it easier for you as a store owner to actually manage um, these international features. So this is things like the markets admin, which I'll show on the next slide, um, but also you know, market optimization. Like how can Shopify give you data and insight to um, basically say when is the best time to go into a particular market or how should I go into a particular market? Um, and a lot of these features will also be coming out soon. So um, these features will just continue to build on and on. Cool, so let's just jump straight into the features. Next slide, please. So if, if you haven't seen it already, um, the starting point for all these features, if you're looking to expand into a different market is this new market section in the settings. Um, this is the first place that you'll go. And basically it's an overview of all the different uh, markets that you have set up. One of the distinctions here is we're not just focusing on, on a single country. Um, we know that if you're setting up a, say an ANZ site, that encompasses you know, two countries. If you're going to the EU, you might have you know, four or five countries all within the one market. So what's really nice is you can actually set up groups of countries. Um, you don't have to set up a single um, instance for every single country that you want to go into. Um, it also has a lot of really nice features about, um, you know, how do you get started? That, that first question that I um, said is really hard for most merchants to figure out, you know, when should I actually go into a different market? Um, this new market admin will help you do that by basically saying, um, you know, X percent of your customers are actually shopping from Canada. Um, it might be a good time to actually open up a market in that particular region. So a lot of the insights that I was talking about are going to be surfaced through this new markets admin. There's going to be some more features um, that will help basically navigate customers to the right, um, right market experience. So domains are a big one here. Basically, you can now add a domain for each market that you want to have. 
And if a customer goes to that domain, they'll see the right currency in the right language um, and all of those kind of market specific features. This is a big one that um, a lot of merchants have asked for. And um, today you can now actually set custom pricing per market for different regions. So if you want to sell something in the US but have a particular markup because of you know, manufacturing or shipping costs or um, you know, different pricing for different markets essentially, you can now do that through the markets admin. So you can go into a product price um, and say, uh, I want to charge in this particular currency and this is how much I want to charge by. Um, and this is going to extend even further. We'll have the APIs to be able to do that automatically. Um, but today you can go in and manually set this up for all of your products um, for each market as well. One of the, the things that I, I think, um, it's a bit of a shock when merchants start to go from you know, AU to the US and they start to encounter things like duties and taxes. And they realize that, um, you know, especially in places like the US, taxes can get really complicated. Um, you know, a bagel is uh, not taxed in, in New York unless it's actually been cut. And then once you cut it, it becomes taxed. So there's always weird kind of tax rules in different regions. Um, you can extrapolate that to you know, different states in the US, um, EU, weird kind of tax rules that you as a merchant might not necessarily want to um, have to try and solve for. So we're introducing a new duties engine that's going to be native into the, into the platform. Um, and we even automatically help categorize a lot of your products. So based on um, either the code that you provide, the HS code, um, or we try and automatically categorize your product into the right duty um, category so that you're just automatically charging the correct duties to your customer and they don't get a shock so that you ship a product to them and they have to pay duties that landed because um, that's obviously not a great experience either. Local payment methods is another one. Um, so in Australia, obviously we have things like Afterpay are huge, um, but most countries have something similar, um, particularly in the EU where we've launched uh, these two particular local payment methods. Um, there's a lot of payment methods that are only exist in particular countries. Um, so if you were to theoretically want to extend to 30 different countries, um, you would have maybe 30 different payment methods, um, but it doesn't make sense for someone in, in the US or Australia um, to see the ideal payment gateway because they don't even know what that is. Um, so what we now let you do is set up local payment methods per market so that a customer can just pay um, with what they expect and they don't see all the other payment gateways for all the other different markets as well. Um, right now, this is only available in a couple of regions, but it's going to expand um, across to different markets as well. So that's the main things that have changed today. Um, the big consolidation there is the fact that all these features are now available in the one place in your settings. You don't have to try and piece together um, all these different things when you're trying to think about going internationally, international, um, because they're not th things that you set up um, that you want to go in and change you know, every day. They're things that you want to just go in and set up once. So now you have this one place in the settings where you can go in and set up a different market and go into a different region. Um, a lot of these features that we previously had, like exchange rates and, and um, taxes, um, have also now been brought into this one section. So if you want to go and expand into the US and, and access that market, um, you now have a single place that you can go and do that. And it is just the beginning. Um, so this is kind of the foundational piece to uh, enable international selling at a much bigger scale. So today we have things like in admin translate, um, but in the future, we're going to have APIs to be able to do that. We're going to have in-admin translation so that when you go onto a product page, you can just translate it right on the product page. Um, things like custom storefront content by market. So if a customer is shopping in a particular market, they'll actually see different content on your store as well. Um, so lots more still to come. So the three things that I, I just want to communicate um, on what this could potentially mean for you, um, particularly in the context of expanding your marketing mix, um, making it more efficient for you to experiment and try in different markets, um, hopefully increasing your sales by um, exposing your business to customers in different markets um, and increasing margins as well. So helping you to basically go into a market in the most efficient way um, and saving you all the setup costs and the time of actually trying to figure all that yourself. I think that's me. Yeah, so uh, it's actually available today. The slide's already out of date. So you should have markets available today. Um, and we also have some developer previews for partners um, as well. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Josh. Like I know personally, like that is a game changer. Like we speak to so many clients, um, existing clients, even like, you know, potential clients and the thought of going internationally and like the time, the money, um, and also so many unknowns. Um, this is obviously just going to make it so much easier for those guys to, to go internationally. So that's awesome. Thank you. 
Um, great. So next up, we are welcoming um, Alex and Ken uh, from Reload Media. So Alex is the performance marketing lead and social product lead here at Reload. So within his role, Alex works really closely with Reload's largest paid advertising clients um, and has a particular focus on, I guess, the social media and social advertising strategies as part of their broader marketing plans. Um, Alex is also our resident Spitzboom in the office, cycling crazy lengths on the weekend and even competing in a 4 by 4 by 48 challenge, which is lots of running every four hours for two days. Like that just makes me tired even explaining it. Um, but today, Alex is going to take us through um, and I guess lean on his experience in management, optimization, reporting and paid advertising strategic planning for um, all of the clients that he does work on um, to help you navigate, I guess, the challenges that he's seen across the social advertising landscape. So um, Alex, I'll hand it over to you. Amazing, thanks, Em. So yeah, as Em mentioned, as part of the um, my role as performance marketing lead, I do work really closely with a lot of Reload's largest clients, um, and in particular, navigating the challenges that we've seen across the paid advertising landscape over the last sort of 12 months off the back of the iOS 14.5 update. So as a little bit of a refresher there, um, that was the update that Apple rolled out as its privacy, first sort of privacy-centric update where users had the ability to opt in and out of uh, tracking across their iOS activity. Um, so that's caused a lot of challenges over the last 12 months. And in particular, as we've kicked off this year, in terms of tracking visibility um, and mostly on the Facebook ads platform. So what I'll be going over today is some tactical responses that you can implement within your Facebook ads strategy to remain iOS 14.5 resilient. So we'll be going through a couple of recommendations I think you can take away and apply to your Facebook ad strategy right now. It's gonna kind of help you navigate some of those challenges that we're facing. And then secondly, taking a look at why diversifying your social ad strategy is more important than ever. We've got a lot of challenges in the platforms at the moment. So just taking a look at uh, the customer journey and how we can support users through that by diversifying our paid strategy. So first of all, let's dive into building some iOS 14.5 resilience tactics into your Facebook ad strategy. So next slide, please. Cool. Uh, so this is what I wanna leave with you as a recommended action plan for your Facebook ad strategy. So on the left-hand side, you'll see three ticked actions um, that are already there. So off the back of Apple's uh, AT&T tracking uh, transparency prompt, uh, in April of 2021, these were three best practice responses as recommended by Facebook to kind of navigate the initial challenges that we saw in the Facebook ads platform. So they were to verify your domain through Facebook Business Manager, to set up your eight aggregated uh, events as per aggregated event measurement, and to enable conversions API, which it works in conjunction with your Facebook Pixel to kind of supplement the loss in tracking data from the Facebook pixel. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on those three today uh, because they were kind of best practice recommendations as made by Facebook last year. So they should already be applied within your Facebook ads account. Instead, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on the three actions on the right-hand side, which are tactical responses you can implement to your Facebook ad strategy today uh, and moving forward to set you up for long-term success on Facebook ads, despite these iOS 14.5 challenges we're facing. So the first one is to utilize lead generation campaigns as part of your always on strategy. Next slide, please. Sweet. So lead generation campaigns are the type of ads that you may have seen before where users are served an ad across Facebook or Instagram uh, and then when they go to uh, click the call to action, it swipes up a form for them to complete and hand over their first party data. Now, these are primarily used in burst periods to kind of supplement like a sale or a competition and collect first party data. Uh, but the recommendation here is to utilize these types of campaigns as part of your always on strategy. That's because these pre-populated forms can drive lead generation volume straight through to your CRM. So if you do have a CRM connected like Klaviyo into Facebook, you can use these types of campaigns and these forms to drive first party opted in data straight through to your Klaviyo platform. 
Uh, this can then go straight into your lists, segments, or even into your welcome flows or any other flows that you have set up. So the reason that we're recommending this from an always on perspective is that even if someone has opted out of that iOS 14.5 tracking, by having this in place from an always on perspective means that you're continually feeding your CRM with opted in first party data. So you're gonna be continually updating those customer lists, uh, feeding those flows, which you're then gonna be able to use back in your Facebook ads as remarketing audiences, exclusion lists. You'd even be able to use that as source audiences for lookalike audiences as part of your prospecting activity. So it's really important to kind of keep feeding Facebook and your CRM with that opted in first party data, which is why we recommend to use this from an always on approach. Uh, next slide. Cool, so the re next recommendation is to utilize ads with product tags. So ads with product tags are simply where you add a product tag to any of your existing video image or carousel creative. In this example, you can see for SteadyRack, uh, which Andy will be touching on later, uh, we're using product tags to drive product discovery straight from this video uh, ad that we have on Instagram. So users are really effectively and quickly able to kind of see the video content, engage with it. It kind of captures their attention to then quickly tap that product tag to go through to learn more about that specific product in more detail. So that will direct them through to your Facebook uh, or Instagram shop product tag where they can then look at all of that product information. So if you're using something like the Facebook sales channel in Shopify, you can pull all of this uh, product information dynamically into your Facebook ad account and then utilize these ads with product tags. So definitely something I recommend to uh, implement across your Facebook ads account now. You can apply it to existing ads in market, um, but be conscious of this and always use where possible to aid in that product and brand discovery. Next slide, cool. And then tying into that one is um, to leverage Facebook and Instagram shops. So Facebook and Instagram shops is a great way to capture users that are taking actions on your Facebook and Instagram platform. Uh, and the big thing here is that because all of the actions within your Facebook and Instagram shop uh, are within the meta ecosystem, it's not reliant on whether users are opted in or opted out of their website tracking activity via the at and prompt, all of that activity is 100% retained. So you're able to you know, create audiences of users who viewed certain products, collections, um, or even users that have added products to their cart but not checked out. Similar to how you would on your website-based audiences, um, but here utilizing what you, what you have in terms of the Facebook and Instagram shop. Uh, what we've found is that shop audiences can be up to 80% different to similar website-based audiences. So you're really able to tap into a different sort of audience here. Um, and finally on this one, you're able to tap into some pretty powerful audience and product reporting that's provided in Commerce Manager via the Insights tab. So I definitely recommend to set this up, um, use your Facebook and Instagram shops as much as possible, drive users through with those ads with product tags, um, and then build those audiences to use in your paid advertising uh, from a remarketing perspective. Cool, uh, moving on to kind of the second part that I wanted to touch on today. Um, and this is kind of looking at how you can diversify your paid advertising strategy and basically why we kind of need to diversify that strategy. So um, moving on to the next slide, I wanna start with a little bit of a customer journey kind of theory and some research that we have. So what we have here in the middle is a, a diagram of the customer journey from kind of that trigger point as users go through exploration and evaluation of products and brands right through to that purchase stage. So the challenge with only having one channel or being heavily reliant on one channel as kind of supporting this entire customer journey is that it can really lead to a fragmented customer journey with major communication gaps. And that's never been more kind of present and uh, the challenge has been ne never been felt as much as now as when Facebook, particularly if you're heavily reliant on this channel, now has used certain users opted out of being tracked. It can cause these gaps in that journey uh, where users may not be supported in that exploration and evaluation stages 
as much as possible or not kind of remarketing and pushing those purchases. Instead, what we kind of want to get to is on the next slide, uh, we want to kind of get towards this ideal state. So this is um, kind of mapping out an ideal state across the customer journey. And this is where we have a range of different social platforms that fuel the recognition and demand for your brand or your product. Um, so it's really triggering users um, to kind of start that research journey for your brand or your product. Then we can utilize a range of different social platforms to nurture and educate users with valuable content and social proof as they move through these evaluation and exploration stages. Uh, we're able to tap into those different channels that they might be visiting, not being solely reliant on Facebook ads across the Facebook and Instagram platforms. We can utilize those other platforms to keep supporting these users as they make their mind up on what products they want to purchase. And then finally, having those channels present to effectively and cost efficiently convert those users really quickly. So this is the kind of ideal state that we want to get to, which is a seamless customer journey that addresses all of those key motivators and barriers. Um, so with that kind of theory in mind, I want to recommend now three platforms that I think you should kind of look towards um, to diversify your, your paid advertising strategy. The first one is YouTube ads. And again, here we have an example that we're running for Steady Rack at the moment. Um, and this is where through YouTube ads, it's a great way to complement your Facebook ad strategy, particularly if you're already running video ads across that platform. Uh, YouTube has a massive reach uh, across the entire network. And because users are going to the platform with intent, looking for certain video content, you can really tap into that with the videos you show. So you're able to show video ads across relevant interests that users are going to the platform with. Uh, what's best is that YouTube ads are run through the Google ads platform. So you're able to tap into the advanced targeting features available through Google ads, uh, as well as some pretty powerful reporting uh, through the Google ads platform. Uh, next slide. The second is TikTok ads. So we've all seen the insane growth that TikTok has been on recently. Uh, it's now the largest social platform uh, with the most number of active users. So you're able to reach a large and diverse audience group, which is highly active and engaged on the platform. Uh, TikTok and Shopify have also recently announced a recent integration. So you're able to integrate your product feed directly through to TikTok. Um, so you can run similar dynamic product remarketing ads through TikTok as well now, which is awesome. Uh, and finally, we have Pinterest. So um, Pinterest is uh, probably slightly smaller than the other platforms, but you're able to connect with a, a community of like-minded audiences. And these audience have high intent who are actively searching for hyper-relevant content on the platform. So if this platform suits your brand or your product, I'd highly recommend exploring this platform. And to sum up, I'm gonna leave you with these three key takeaways. The first being that privacy-centric updates are here and they're here to stay. So um, just kind of be aware of that. Don't try to kind of do things the way that you have always done them or try to build hacks around these updates. They're here, they've hit Facebook the first and the hardest, but they're gonna to continue to roll out and impact digital marketing more broadly speaking. Secondly, build those recommended iOS 14.5 resilience tactics into your always on Facebook ad strategy. That will set you up for long-term success on the platform amid the challenges that we're facing. And finally, evaluate other channels and look to diversify into other paid social channels to diversify your marketing mix. This is gonna set you up for even longer term success by not being reliant on one channel. Thanks. Amazing, thank you so much, Alex. And I honestly, I can't talk enough about you know diversifying your channel mix i think you know no longer is tiktok just about you know little choreographed dances that everyone just does there are so many businesses on there now and it's such a powerful platform to be able to reach um, those end users um cool so the next person we're going to be welcoming is kate so um kate is a self-confessed puzzle loving data geek who jumped the fence from specialist and generalist and back again she's collected many scout badges um, across search social media content marketing email automation um, and conversion rate optimization kate now combines her breadth of omni-channel experience to help marketers unearth customer insights and attribute the impact of their strategies 
So today, Kate's going to be taking all of the information that we've just heard and talk about how businesses now need to start thinking about multi-touch attribution or click attribution and how media mix modeling can start to bring visibility to your performance. So Kate, I will hand the floor over to you. And just a quick reminder, everyone, please feel free to pop in questions um, into the chat function and we'll loop back to them at the end. Um, but Kate, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for that, Emily, and hi, everybody. Um, just going, following on directly from the challenges that Alex is posing, um, in, in addition to the last couple of years being particularly challenging with, you know, COVID completely changing the customer landscape, I know many retailers are not only um, focusing on just growth, but now also revenue protection. And then in addition to that, we're really losing a lot of visibility that we previously had that helped us to attribute the effectiveness of these strategies and tactics that we're putting in place and um, helping us to determine how we should diversify our marketing mix. Um, so knowing that so many of you will be in different industries, I felt that it would be best instead to kind of give you an appetite of what measurement sits on the horizon for us now with all of these changes at play. So how we can start to, how we should start to think about multi-touch, um, the new methods that are on the horizon like uh, media mix modeling. And traditionally businesses haven't invested a lot in measurement because we've had so much of that at our disposal within the plat platforms. Um, but with that kind of increasing murkiness and lack of visibility that's kind of only increasing over time, uh, we need to start looking at different attribution methodologies and perspectives and starting to really put some investment away into dedicated measurement principles and attribution methodologies so that we can start to make the best decisions that we can. Uh, next slide, yeah. So just to level set a little bit, um, when I think about attribution, I always like to make sure that I share these two sound bites. Um, for making sure that we interpret the data in the best way that we should be. The first one is um, about measuring your intuitions. So all of you, and I'm sure, have lots of experience within your own industries. Um, and if you're a phenomenal marketer and um, business owner, I'm sure that you spend a lot of time trying to intimately understand uh, your customer experiences and their perspectives. And that's not to be discounted. Our intuition does matter. Um, but I always say we should absolutely measure it. Um, we don't always know everything uh, and that kind of gives us a good steer. It is also important to know though that we are working in you know, an infinite game of marketing. Uh, that game is changing all the time, every day. We can't control for every variable and no amount of modeling, uh, even predictive modeling, which we love to do, will give us a crystal ball. So looking back, we should remember when, um, whenever running attribution methodologies, looking back will only ever tell you whether or not the decisions that you made yesterday were good ones. So if you plan to change your strategy, invest and diversify your mix, um, or really push the boundaries of innovation, change your value proposition, introduce a new loyalty program, all of those things won't necessarily, you won't necessarily have all of the signals that you need to progress forward with that. So with that in mind, attribution should be bringing us confidence, but not certainty. So yeah, I always say look back to look forward. Attribution is sticky and messy and super complex, but it should be built to give us signals and direct um, our focus uh, towards that, that next best decision. But it's kind of something that should be embedded within everything that we do. All right, so at the Loomery, um, where we are a MarTech consultancy that really focuses on bridging the, the void that exists between brands and their customers. Part of that obviously includes uh, attribution and um, our understanding of measurement and the data void, which is becoming increasingly more difficult to understand as data continues to be more siloed and then platforms themselves change things on us and become more of a black box. So what do we really have um, as the yardsticks of measurement to understand whether or not the decisions that Alex has just taken you through um, are effective or not? And how can we make sure that we measure it with integrity and then direct that future investment? Uh, so I'm gonna just quickly run you through what the three um, principles are. So multi-touch attribution. So multi-touch is something that you're probably all doing a lot already at the moment. It's what is kind of the easiest uh, attribution method to dabble in, but as you slowly start to scale, it becomes the hardest to master. Um, so touch, as touch suggests, often also referred to as click attribution is based on action. So it's based on individual user behavior that's taken off the back of whatever initiative it was that you put in place. 
Um, so we're measuring those interactions over time. And ideally, we need to use a level of um, interpretation to try to understand um, how each of the platforms and each of the strategies that we've got in play are being built to encourage a certain action and a certain intent um, and ideally laddering up to push people down the funnel and down the journey. So that's from a touch perspective. Um, media mix modeling, uh, on the contrary, is all about impressions. So unlike needing to ensure that we have the right collection in play where we need from a multi-touch perspective, um, media mix modeling offers us a completely new lens of interpretation. This is because we can start to ladder everything up and standardize measurement based on impressions. So just whether or not the channel existed and whether or not it was in market, um, we can put all of that data into a model and run a regression analysis to determine that kind of correlation. The other massive benefit of MMM, in addition to being able to kind of standardize that metric and marry together offline and organic variables, is that you can even account for things like seasonality, business life cycle, employment rates, COVID lockdown periods, and start to really discern and get a sense of what impact are each of my channels having relative to one another, but relative to the environment as well. So unlike multi-touch, which really can't give us all of that, multi-touch helps us optimize on a channel level and tweak behavior to see whether or not this format of an ad was better than the other one and whether or not collectively we're kind of inching people closer um, in conversion towards our goal. All of a sudden, MMM, when you look at it alongside MTA, gives you a new lens to understand, hang on, our organic activity, which we've been ramping up in search, and, and search, in, uh, search for example, and social media, um, if that's having a greater impact as you are continu continuing to invest in that organic activity? And at what point should you start to diversify, increase or even decrease um, some investment in paid channels um, as you start to grow as a business? And then finally, uh, the absolute gold standard of measurement is uh, incrementality measurement. So incrementality is based on the scientific method, the same as, um, you know, as we are measuring kind of biology experiments and all of that. You have a, a control group um, that is held out from uh, what it is that you're testing for, and then you have a treatment group who is offered the communication that you're looking to test. Um, this is the gold standard because it allows us to understand um, what would have happened if we didn't run any marketing at all? So there are going to be a percentage of people that just convert anyway um, because they were looking for what it was that you had on offer. How do we actually genuinely measure with integrity uh, the point in which our marketing activities had made, made a real big difference on what we were trying to move the needle on and incrementality solves for that? Next slide. So I've created these mostly so that you have something to reference after today, but I won't labor on them too much because uh, just for the sake of time. Um, but I did just want to reiterate because I think multi-touch is probably something that you're all doing a lot of now. And it's certainly, if you're not, something that you could jump on immediately following this call if you have any platforms in market whatsoever. So again, like the benefits of MTA is you can jump into Facebook, jump into Google Analytics and get a sense of where people are um, interacting with your site and taking action and um, converting. You can do that immediately. The um, limitations and the difficulties, of course, are as you start to layer more channels in and you start running Facebook and TikTok and Pinterest, it's about making sure that the collection of the events and those touches that you're gaining um, are done so with a, a methodology in mind. So are you capturing the same kinds of events across each of those different platforms, knowing that they all have their own collection methodologies? And then how are you aligning all of those frameworks together so that you've got an interpretation that is, that, um, is standardized and aligned for the different channels in the mix that you have? Um, so yeah, that's that's multi multi touch. MMM, um, I've kind of already highlighted uh, some of the benefits of you know what we know we can get out of this. Um, but in addition to what I mentioned in terms of being able to get visibility around TV, offline, and organic variables, um, as well as controlling for those kind of external impacts, it also means that we can kind of skirt and get around a lot of those data silos. 
So if you find that your collection is a little bit of a mess um, from a touch perspective, it's often quite a lot simpler to not even need all of your data to be in one place, but to be able to go to your TV campaigns, you know, go to go directly to TikTok ads, go to directly to um, Pinterest ads and get an export out of all of your spend and impression data, standardize that in, a, in a, an Excel format pump it into a model and then in six to eight weeks get spat out exactly um, the point of diminishing returns for each of those channels and where you should reallocate spend. So when we're talking about diversifying that marketing mix, that gives you the steer on, hey, um, looking back from the data that you ingested, um, if you don't change your strategy, we'd recommend that you reallocate um, a little bit more spend to Facebook and rep down Google search maybe, um, and it will tell you exactly the point in which um, you can start to maximize that efficiency, which is super important right now for a lot of retailers who are focusing on that revenue protection or even down weighting spend off the back of um, capitalizing on COVID when people were at home, depending on your industry. Um, and then finally, incrementality. So um, as I mentioned, one of the best ways to measure the, the difference and really control for variables in real time without a lot of kind of um, need for a data scientist, you sort of set it up and then you've got the opportunity to hold people out um, from a lot of platforms and, and measure that genuine lift. Um, and yeah, the, the obvious benefit of this is that you've got that chance to have that highest possible integrity uh, measurement and um, know for absolute certain whether or not uh, you're lifting and actually driving growth over time. So I've talked a lot about, I guess, the concepts, but in order to genuinely get started with some of these as of immediately, um, MTA, uh, one of my favorite places to go to get a bit of a steer and a sense of how touches are laddering up to driving what we want is to look at Google Analytics uh, channel grouping paths. Um, one thing that I do want to point out and just uh, to, the, to the point that was made earlier by M around um, you know, what we're seeing in terms of cookies and even iOS, we've got um, organic search up the top here in this screenshot. And I, um, you can actually drill further down to get a sense of keywords if those keywords um, are visible, sometimes they're not. Um, but very, very often um, you will see organic search um, and the branded keyword be right up the top um, for your MTA channel path grouping. And when you think about the underlying collection and the data that's underpinning this, it makes total sense because when we think about the genuine conversion path and how long it takes people to engage, it might take people six to eight weeks. It might take them months to make a decision and they might have many interactions with the brand. But um, the point in which we're able to view this, depending on cookies and ad blockers and all of the things that we have that's sampling this data, you might actually only be able to capture the last little bit of their funnel. Um, so all really important things to keep in mind when interpreting. And that's why most of the effort for MTA goes into understanding your collection, creating a methodology, and then knowing that you've got the right analyst translating for you so that you can make the best decisions. MMM, if you want to get started and you don't have the ability to either the investment to make in um, a custom team, a data team like us at Illumary to help you build that, um, you do have the option to just do what I used to do uh, before I had that as an opportunity, which is to just group together the kinds of channels that you have at each stage of the funnel that based on what you're intending to do and start to calculate how much you're spending across each of those interactions. Then if you align that to what conversion you're seeing with your MTA, you can kind of get a bit of a sense of where your investment's going and where you might need to shift it um, by using those two lenses together. So it's not a complete replacement for MMM, but it does um, give you a little bit of visibility over investment. And then finally, um, and I'm sure uh, Alex and, and the team at Reload would love doing a lot of this as well, uh, Facebook and you know even Google Optimize offer conversion lift experiments as well. So you can, um, work directly in platform for a lot of platforms like Facebook to um, create a group that's held out and then a treatment group that's served an ad so that you can measure the genuine lift between and get a sense of, hey, who would have actually converted if we hadn't have shown them anything. Um, and then finally, I um, have worked with the team over at the Loomery to develop a retail analytics measurement framework. Um, as I sort of mentioned earlier, we want these signals, we don't want to get lost in all of the opportunities um, 
and all of the different rabbit holes that we could go down. Uh, there's so much data at our disposal. Sometimes we just need a bit of a steer to know where to look um, and know that where we look is really just about giving us the next best direction to make that next best decision. So again, don't seek certainty. Don't get lost in the data seeking certainty. Um, just seek confidence for your next best decision and keep iterating and keep measuring and benchmarking. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kate. And I think it's such a good topic to talk about right now, because I think when a lot of businesses talk about attribution, like sometimes it can be a really scary thing, but um, it's so important now to actually start. So I think those um, those little cards that you've kind of created um, will be really essential for businesses. And um, I'll be sharing out the um, video, which will have all of that, along with um, the, the document that Kate mentioned there as well. Um, so now we're on to our final speaker. So um, we're going to now welcome Andy, who's from Steady Rack. So um, Andy started his career working in agencies um, for WPP Group in Sydney and London on well-known brands like Audi, Westpac, Expedia, Tesco and Ford. So after returning home to Perth and working as a business director on local brands like RAC um, and Edith Cowan University, he decided to make the switch to a client-side role. So Andy now leads the marketing team at Steady Rack, overseeing a team focused on driving global awareness and sales, both online and in retail stores for the brand. So Andy is one of those merchants who right now is implementing a lot of the stuff we've already spoken about. So I'm super excited um, to, yeah, to see Andy's presentation today. And um, yeah, Andy, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks, Em. Um, morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Andrew, but everybody calls me Andy, except for my parents. So um, yeah, uh, as Em said, we're, we're a merchant that's kind of already on this journey already. So um, uh, next slide, please, let's dive right in. So for those of you who don't know uh, what Steady Rack is, I'll just touch on it really quickly. But basically, we're a uh, extremely innovative bike storage solution product. Um, we're really innovative because of really two key features that uh, it doesn't need any lifting to get your bike up into a steady rack and it's really, really space saving. So it's really uh, great for lots of garages and lots of um, like apartment buildings and things like that. So uh, the interesting journey that we're on at the moment from a marketing perspective is that steady racks existed for about 10 years based off, you know, a really innovative bike storage product. And now we're looking to diversify into lots more different sporting products. Like we've got ski and snowboarding and surfboarding, surfing all coming uh, down the pipeline. So from a marketing perspective, we're in the job of transitioning from being a unique product to a trusted global brand. Uh, next slide, please. And so I guess pre iOS 14, uh, our channel mix was really, really small. Um, and all of our, so from a channel perspective, um, we were really only running uh, Facebook and Instagram for all of our prospecting and retargeting, uh, search uh, mix of uh, Google branded and unbranded, and then of course shopping ads, and then driving a lot of uh, organic reach through Facebook and Instagram, and really only using uh, one influencer partner. Um, and then from a creative perspective, I just kind of chucked in a few old examples of work. Uh, apart from the logo that you see in the top left corner, everything looks really, really disparate across all of our touch points. And uh, when you actually read through everything, it's very, very retail focused. It's not very brand focused, but in saying all that, uh, you know, it worked um, for five years, we were doubling and tripling year on year and we're continuing to do so, which is absolutely fantastic. But um, this was pre iOS 14. Uh, and now the next slide is scary. So <laughs> then iOS 14 happened. Um, so what you're looking at here is basically uh, I think iOS 14 happened in June in Australia for us, and it was, uh, you know, incrementally rolled out throughout the back end of um, 2021. And what you're looking at here is our website visitors and our sessions through the last six months, um, well, starting in July. Uh, and what, what, uh, what you can kind of see here is basically it's a 17% reduction month on month uh, across uh, our website visits. And effectively what we were really seeing is because we were relying so heavily on Facebook and Instagram to really drive our brand awareness and then Google to mop up all the search when people started searching for Steady Rack when they were coming into, into market, because we'd relied so heavily on those channels and Facebook had lost the ability to track people off their app. Basically, we were seeing a lot of significant wastage in Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so we needed to do something, we needed to do something pretty drastically. And luckily, uh, we had probably already started talking about moving into more channels, probably around August and September, but around the May time, and we'll jump to the next slide here, please. Uh, around May, um, we were working with the Reload team to really implement a new strategic framework. So previously, our comms was really all focused on 
uh, you know, there was one pot of money driving return on ad spend as its key growth goal um, and serving that globally. So we weren't really filling up. We weren't really introducing the brand to new customers. We were only introducing the brand to, you know, people who are already in market. So we split out really effectively what our four different customer stages were. Uh, and these are going to be different to every single business. Uh, every single market is completely different. So for us, uh, what we wanted to, I guess, nurture our customers through was from a brand awareness stage where they're completely unaware of Steady Rack to a stage where they're starting to look for storage solutions. So product awareness hits there, then diving into product experience, which is all about, you know, proving why Steady Rack is the right choice. So if at this particular point, our customers would probably be aware of us and starting to search for us amongst the competition because in the end of the day, we're a storage product. So there's going to be some DIY, there's going to be some drilling. So they need to make sure that, um, you know, they're able to put it all together. Uh, and then finally, conversion and purchase. But in addition to this, uh, next slide, great transition there. Thank you. Um, so in addition to this, we overlaid key channels into every single one of these different customer stages. Um, so I'm not going to read all the channels out, but I think what you will see uh, if you read down them is that a lot of uh, channels kind of cross numerous different uh, customer stages. So social sits in those first three, our website sits in the bottom two. And I think the reason for that, it, it's very important to realize that uh, as much sense as a marketing funnel makes, I think we all as human beings know that, um, you know, a, a customer journey path is non-linear. I mean, uh, when you actually think about it, people are kind of bumping into your brand communications in the areas that they're interacting. And it's as much as we'd love it to be this really linear, seamless process where we nurture somebody through brand awareness to eventually purchasing, I think we all in our guts know that that's not the case. So it's really, really important to make sure that each one of your brand touch points are still elevating the brand at a higher, higher level, but also delivering on each of those individual customer requirements in each stage. And one thing before we jump off this slide, I will also say that's extremely important that uh, I'm not willing to share in this presentation is behind each one of those uh, key channels is really specific KPIs. I think you really, really need to identify what is your target for each one of your customer stages and each one of your channels to really get an understanding of how well your marketing mix is performing. Um, so yeah, let's jump to the next slide, please. So what we started doing, and this is some creative that um, uh, has just launched on YouTube. So we've really revamped our, our brand look and feel and our communications to really um, showcase our brand as much as possible. Uh, we'll jump to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I think what you can see from where we were previously is we're, we're really investing in a lot more bolder creative. We're really making sure that our steady rack branding is very, very prevalent. Um, we're using a lot of, uh, you know, key brand identifiers. So for us, it's the color red, it's our fonts. Um, and also it's our sort of cheeky and irreverent tone. That's why you kind of get things like bloody hard coming in here, which is, um, uh, and a very Aussie thing. I'm imagining most people on here are Australian. So I'm looking forward to seeing how well that lands in Germany. Uh, but we'll see. Um, but in addition to this, so uh, what you're seeing here is our social creative has obviously been revamped, but we're also starting to invest in programmatic display. Uh, that's only going to start going live in March. So I'm yet to share any results for that. Um, but let's jump to our next slide. Um, we're also investing in more social channels. Uh, so Pinterest is sitting over here. Uh, as I said before, we're starting to invest in YouTube. Uh, another interesting one, which the Relo team convinced me of, uh, which I was really unsure about at first, but it's proving res uh, getting results. So I can't complain there is Bing. Um, so Bing, obviously not very big in Australia, but um, we are also quite a big brand in the US. So it's really performing well for us there. So diversifying our search as well. And then a really, really important part for us, and this kind of sits in, our, I guess, our product experience layer is all about using uh, our influencers in a smarter way. So previously we had one influencer, we are now at a, a team of, I think about eight to 10 influencers. Um, but then there's different ways that we're starting to use the content that they generate for us. So uh, the first one on the left-hand side is branded content ads within Facebook and Instagram. So this is a really uh, great, uh, I guess, format that now exists. I thoroughly recommend if you're using influencers to start looking into this because it allows you to really leverage their audience reach and suck it in and do like a boosted post in a much more uh you know, measurable way and attribute that particular post to its own ad set within your Facebook group, which is great. Uh, we're also starting to do sponsored YouTube videos as well. So uh, this particular gentleman in the center is a, a UK based mountain biking pro and uh, he completely renovated his garage and did a YouTube episode for us. So really starting to look into 
those people who are already big in YouTube, rather than taking them into a platform that we're more familiar with, like Facebook and Instagram, really leveraging in, uh, their audience where their audience was built. So on YouTube. Uh, and then another really important thing for us is looking into cycling media partnerships. Uh, at Steadyrack, the way that we look at influencers is not somebody who has a massive Instagram following. Uh, influencers to us are people who can influence the market much more broadly. So cycling media really comes into this. This particular uh, piece of creative you're seeing here is we recently did a campaign with Cycling Tips that is still ongoing and Cycling Tips are one of the biggest uh, publications and online websites for, um, for cycling brands. Uh, yeah, cool. So let's jump to the next slide. Um, so I will say that with this, the kind of the journey that we're on, uh, we're still sort of early days into our media mix. I think we we revamped everything and started diversifying into these new channels in January after developing the new strategic framework from probably May to June and then new creative in the back half of 2021. So whilst I don't have any specific results to share for you, I will say initial signs are really, really positive. Um, our conversion rate on our website since, you know, kind of doing that downward climb uh, over the back half of last year, our conversion rate in the last month or two has jumped up 50%. So that's fantastic. We're reaching our audience exactly where we need to. Um, so because I didn't want to share any sort of hard business goals, I thought I'd share some tips, which might be relevant to a lot of other merchants out there. Um, and the first one I feel like is the most important as a marketer and put your customers first. Um, I, I mean, it sounds really obvious, but really understand your customers, who they are, what their needs are and where they interact with your brand. Um, secondly is to be channel agnostic. I think we're super lucky in this day and age in digital marketing. I remember when I started my career 10 years ago, every single platform had a different spec. It was really, really difficult to take one piece of creative and then diversify it out across all of your different brand touch points. Now it's so easy. Uh, it's the same video asset that you can load into every single one of those social platforms and most online, uh, like publications, they also accept those formats as well. So what that frees up from our side of things is a lot of budget. So we can really be channel agnostic. I mean, we're taking one piece of creative and putting it in front of our customers, regardless of where they interact. Uh, another one extremely important, as I touched on before, is really set those clear KPIs. Uh, they really should be unique to each channel and comms objective, um, and they should change throughout your customer journey. So, you know, our, our first stage is very much about broad awareness figures. It's about impressions. It's about reach. But when we're, you know, further down that, that, uh, I guess, journey, it changes quite a lot. Um, another one which is really important is to really embrace the good, the bad, and the scary numbers. Uh, you know, there can be a lot of scary numbers when you open the black box of attribution and you find out where your media spend is actually going. Um, but don't get, you know, get scared about it, but then, you know, do something. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of power, there's a lot of growth, and there's a lot of insights you can take from confronting the data. Uh, and then finally, um, just be true to your brand. I think really understand who is your brand, what does your brand do, and what does your brand serve? Like, oh, sorry, who are the people that your brand serves? Be really, really clear on that because if you're really clear on who your brand is, who are the people that you are, uh, that you're targeting, then it gives you a fantastic springboard to create really, really amazing and cut through creative across each one of your touch points. Cool. Amazing. Thanks so much, Andy. And I think I can speak for everyone where I also want to just say thanks for like the honesty. I think um, there was a few people that were commenting in the chat when you showed us that graph of the decline, like not everything is sunshine and rainbows all the time. So you kind of have to go through that to, to learn and then adapt and continue to grow. Um, so that is the end of all of our um, speakers today. Um, we will be welcoming you back for q and I know that we've gone a little bit over though. So if you do have to rush off to another meeting, totally understand. Um, I just wanted to quickly summarize, we do have a few, I guess, supporting material um, that we will be sending out via email. So keep an eye out in your inbox um, for this one. We'll also be sending the um, video recording and these resources, but I'll pop them into the chat now as well. Um, so Reload are offering, I guess, like a free digital campaign audit. If you wanna know how you can get the most out of your channels and if they're currently performing well, um, just click on that link and fill in your details um, and one of our team will get in touch. We've also put the link in there for the free um, retail analytics handbook, which is what um, Kate and the team at Lumery have put together. Um, and then also if you want to learn more about Shopify markets, um, that link is in there as well. 
So um, if you'd like to stay up to date with any of the Shopify meetups, I know that we had a few new faces in here. So please feel free to connect with us, either join the community, um, click on our socials or also meetup.com. Um, but because you have attended this one, it will mean that you will get the invites for the next ones as well. So um, hopefully we'll see you guys at the next one. Um, so with that, I will welcome back the panel um, just for a quick Q&A. Um, we are, yeah, five minutes over. So if you are keen to stick around, please feel free. Um, we'll run through a few quick questions um, and then, yeah, we'll um, go from there. So we can stop sharing our presentation now. Um, so firstly, guys, thank you so much and welcome back. Um, I think what I'd love to start off with, um, and this can kind of go out, I think, to, to a few of the team, um, is one of the questions that came through just in regards to like experiments and how you can actually test if things are working or not. Um, so we might actually start off with Kate. Um, the question is, what are some of the data tools that you can use to run experiments? And are there, are there any that you would recommend store owners could potentially use themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of individual platforms allow you the ability now to start running experiments. So depending on where you want to run that experiment, um, either go to your ad platform directly, Facebook conversion lift was the one uh, that I mentioned uh, in the pack there. Um, equally, you've got like Google Optimize, Dynamic Yield, you can set up a holdout group um, within those platforms that allows you to run robust experimentation. But ultimately, um, as the business matures, you want to get to a stage where you can implement a global holdout within your core infrastructure. So wherever that lives, um, someone mentioned Clavio before, and that way you can hold out a group of people, even a small group of every single marketing communication and know that you can report back to the business on um, exactly what marketing was responsible for. Yeah, for sure. And Andy, have you guys run um, many experiments like within Steerack? Obviously, you went through like this huge transition. Yeah, massive one. Um, I know Alex is constantly running uh, experiments in the background for us. I think we've got a new Clavio lookalikes test coming up, which is really good fun. So um, yeah, we're constantly looking into, I guess, new experiments that we can run. And I definitely have a big focus for this year. Um, once we've kind of, we're in the process of moving to Shopify 2.0 at the moment. So that's quite a busy, busy job. Uh, I see Josh smiling as, as, as I say that. Um, but yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more about, you know, testing and learning is such an extremely important part as a brand to really understand what works. Um, and just weird stuff happens sometimes. I remember we did a campaign with Westpac where we did a split AB test where we, the only thing that was different was the call to action button went from red to purple and the purple button performed 65% higher or something like that. So don't just think about, you know, uh, think about not just the media side of things that you can do from a experimentation perspective, but a creative side of things as well, because sometimes really unexpected results come out, which can, you know, impact all of your future learning. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Alex, do you want to kind of take us through some of the, I guess, tests and, and experiments that you've seen across different paid channels? Yeah, for sure. So I think the biggest thing here um, when testing like new paid advertising channels is to just be aware that it is a test. So be willing to kind of separate out some of your budget um, so whatever your monthly budget is or, or however you kind of slice and dice your budget, um, just kind of, we work towards a benchmark of 10 to 15%. Take that out and use that as kind of a testing budget to test new channels or new campaigns um, so that if you do some research and you find, okay, TikTok is somewhere where my audience is and that's a test I want to run, uh, you can allocate that budget to that channel, run the test um, and kind of get those learnings on the channel from there, you'll be able to take the learnings, um, then kind of celebrate the wins, learn from what the losses were, like what didn't work about that test, and then just reiterate and test again. It's kind of pretty important just to kind of take that testing mentality to um, yeah, have the budget set aside, run a test, um, see if it, it proved correct or wrong, um, learn from that and then run again. Mm. And then Josh, is there anything like within the Shopify platform that gives you the ability? I mean, Andy's mentioned there, like you're not just testing like audiences, you're testing creative too. Like how, how do you kind of get around that and how can merchants do that within the platform? So there's actually something rolling out at the moment, um, which I, I think it's maybe with about 10% of stores. So everyone should probably have it by the end of the week. Um, there's a new customer like notebooks data platform. So within your customer section, you can write essentially like SQL to define your customer segments in your store. So you can say um, if a customer has purchased X amount of times or if they're from a certain country. So you can actually create those segments now in Shopify. 
Um, and I think that's something we always kind of recommend is get familiar with like the reporting that's in Shopify, set up like custom ones, um, experiment, play with those. Um, and now with like this new customer segmentation feature, that's just going to get a lot more powerful. So you can do a lot of this all natively within the platform as well. Yeah, awesome. Um, so we have a question here that was submitted by Alicia um, and it's mainly for you, Andy, but I'm keen for um, kind of everyone to really comment. Um, and you mentioned that you um, were measuring KPIs and obviously I'm not going to share all of these uh, KPIs, but like what do you kind of work off and what, well, how did you even come up with those KPIs? What do you kind of work off? Are there any that you would recommend that people need to look at um, straight away? Um, that is a bit of a tricky one for us because I think with where Steady Rack is, you know, we've got a job of not only driving our own online stores sales, we were available in a lot of retail stores as well throughout the world. So I guess in Australia, we're in every single Anaconda store, um, you know, we're in 99 bikes and Trek bikes, but we're also, you know, in the US, uh, in uh, Target, Walmart, Home Depot, and we're in conversations with Costco. So I think we have a very interesting challenge from a marketing perspective to try and unify those offline sales with what the brand awareness stuff that we're doing online. Um, but I guess when it comes to specific KPIs, I think it still comes down to what are each one of those individual touch points. So I think big ones for us are obviously brand awareness, which comes through reach and impressions. And of course, those are both offline and online metrics. Uh, then right the way through to, um, I guess, if we're talking more uh, direct uh, advertising or direct communications where you're trying to drive an immediate sale, that's all about uh, click-through rates, um, website visits, obviously in there as well. Um, and then really, if you want to get down and dirty with it all, uh, is ROAS. Um, I'm not a big fan of the ROAS metric until you get down to that conversion stage. I see Kate smiling because she probably agrees with me. Yeah. I'm um, going to be like, let's pass it over to Kate after I'm sure she yeah. has some thoughts too. <laughs> yeah. Cause the only thing I'll say from a marketing perspective, um, on ROAS is that it doesn't measure long-term brand growth. This is a constant battle I am facing, um, and as I'm sure any other marketers on the chat will be facing as well, is how can you, how can you turn a reach and impression soft metric into something as hard as a ROAS? Um, I'm still working that out, so <laughs> I might throw over to Kate from there. MMM. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I guess, um, and it's obviously part of the reason why I see it being the thing that um, businesses are now going to have to invest in MMM because MTA is just becoming more of a black box. We just don't have the ability to um, have large enough sample sizes that indicate like the level of confidence that we used to have. Um, and MMM gives us that opportunity to go, okay, whatever had an impression or a reach, let's model it properly and then use predictive like well, regression analysis and then predict what that budget should be reallocated to. And it will give you an exact ROI per channel. Um, so it gives you the ROI with consideration to seasonality and lockdowns and all of the other things that could have been at play. Gives that certainty. Awesome. Um, Josh, there has been one question that's come through um, just around Shopify markets and there's, there's merchants that are already using it or like not already using markets but are already selling internationally. So I guess they want to understand like what's the key difference now between selling with markets and what they're currently doing. Yeah, so I, maybe I didn't present very well. The, uh, but no, the, there's two things, um, two main things. Um, one, we see particularly with like Shopify Plus, even if you can sell internationally, you can often get to a point where you need to have a separate store or you need to manage something separately. Um, and we don't want merchants to have to necessarily do that. Like you should be able to grow to whatever size, um, you know, to IPO, we say, um, just through the one store potentially. And so markets is really more the foundational first piece to let you do that. So you don't have to worry about, um, you know, setting up different stores, setting up different businesses, stuff like that. Um, so there's that one. And then there's also just consolidating all these different features that have kind of been scattered throughout the admin. So like multi-currency, language support, different content based on where you are, all those different features, which are kind of scattered in different areas, just consolidating them into the one place because you only really want to set it up once. Um, and then we'll start to do the reverse where we start to, filter those into intuitive places. So if you want a product page, you can just say, here's a price for Germany, for customers in Germany, here's a price for US customers, here's a translation. Um, yeah, th those are the big differences. Yeah, and I guess it's just gonna make it like way easier, right? Like you don't you don't have to, yeah, update all those different stores and all those different things. Like you've got that one centralized database, which is perfect. Exactly, yeah. Cool, um, we are over time. 
as I said before. Um, but what I would love to do is just to wrap up the meetup and just, yeah, um, to kind of summarize everything. I want to go around for each of the speakers and I want to ask you all if you could give one tip to everyone that's in the call today of something that they just absolutely must do um, either after this call um, or sometime in the next couple of weeks, what would that number one recommendation be? And I'm going to start with Josh because you're on my big screen. So you're welcome. <laughs> Mine's probably like the least tangible tip, but um, like one thing I say is like, and this, I'm obviously going to be biased here, but like think about the green path. Um, so markets is a really interesting example here where you can build an international site today that caters for these different people, like using markets as an example, but is it going to be relevant in a year's time? Like what does shopping internationally mean in a year's time and what will um, an international site look like then? Um, so if you build for something today, odds are it's going to be outdated in 12 months. So stick to what you can in what we call the green path, um, because it's just going to mean that um, the platform grows with you and your solution is going to stay up to date without you having to do a lot more extra work. Yeah, it's like not getting distracted by just like new and shiny if it doesn't fully align. Yeah. Um, Alex, I'll hand over to you next. Sweet. Um, so I think my key takeaway for everyone is kind of going to go back to the second of the takeaways that I shared. So um, no doubt in Facebook, we're definitely facing challenges um, over the past year. And we're gonna kind of keep seeing and being confronted with those challenges on the platform. But I think those three resilience tactics that you can build into your Facebook ad strategy will kind of keep um, and keep bringing you success on the platform. Um, so yeah, roll out those three tactics in particular, utilize those lead generation campaigns to keep feeding first party data because amid all of these privacy centric updates continuing to uh, build your CRM database with opted in first party data is going to really kind of help your brand long term um, and not just across like Facebook ads or your paid advertising but also across other channels like email so um, yeah just keep working with those resilience tactics and building that into your plays on strategy. Perfect Andy you're up uh, so my number one thing would just really, it's always coming back to the customers for me, like from a marketing perspective, like my job here at Steady Rack is to really understand our customers, understand what channels they play in and understand, you know, what are their needs? What are their wants? What are their drivers? Um, if you can answer those questions and really get a solid understanding of who your customer is, you can, you can build from there. So I think, you know, it's always going to come back to me, making sure you truly understand who your customers are and where they're coming from and then working to that. Amazing. And then Kate, to bring it home, what is your number one recommendation? No pressure. Um, <laughs> my number one would be a, a lot of brands track um, all of the different touches and conversion metrics, but not a lot of brands track the shift that they make in the level of investment. So um, to Alex's point, if you're you know, diversifying your marketing, it's trying new things. Um, if you don't, aren't at the stage yet where you can invest in a bespoke model, you can still track whether or not you moved budget from here to here and what that looked like and what you got. And that's the, the next best thing you can do before you get to MMM that will tell you more than just MDAO. Awesome. Great. Well, honestly, guys, thank you so much for all of the time and effort. I think that went into pulling those slides together. Like I think it was really informative. Um, I personally learned a lot. So thank you guys so much for explaining all of the complex things. Um, we will be sending out the video recording after this, along with all of those additional resources. So um, yeah, thank you to the panel and thank you to everyone for sticking with us in these last 15 minutes. Um, now, if you're in Brisbane, you get to go have some delicious lunch. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you all at the next meetup. Thanks, guys.